Hello, folks. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Book Bites. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Gibson, <laughs> who's going to explain my work for me. Yes. No, there, just it, it's big. And, uh, well, it, these are great uh, weights and uh, book stops. So, very, uh, door stops. Yeah, very good. If you have a truck like I do and you plow, as I have often done over the years, they're great in the far back. They just give that w the weight to those rear wheels. So it's another use. Yes. Well, we're, we're delighted to have Dr. Doug Stewart here with us to talk about his new publication of uh, commentary and uh, uh, Hosea. And we're uh, grateful for his contributions to the school and also to the um, body of knowledge that we use as we do our exegesis. And it's a delight to be able to have you here at Book Bites today. Thank you. So as, as we begin, maybe you could tell us uh, a little bit about these big books and uh, the place that Hosea has in them. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Here, I'm going to hand them to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pass out both of these eventually and have them excuse me, circulate among you because um, I, I always think it's great to just hold a book in your hand if somebody's talking about it and just leaf a little bit through it, just get a feel for it. Somehow the impression that that can make it can be very helpful and positive. Specifically today we're talking about the Zondervan NIV Study Bible. It's just out. It, it, it came out only a few months ago, and it's uh, the thicker of these two books. Um, I think if I hold it up this way, you can see it's a pretty substantial volume uh, for a study Bible. So it's the kind of thing if a high school kid uh, took to school in the current climate, he'd be shot. Uh, because it's just obviously a, 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 an evil weapon on the, in the hands of a Christian. Uh, I did Hosea for that study Bible. And the notes and the introduction that I did to Hosea are really more substantial than is the usual case with study Bibles. I have contributed, to the best of my knowledge, to five different study Bibles. So each of them's a little bit different. I did one for a, a British edition, which was very minimal, just some introduction to the major prophets and then some particular introduction to the minor prophets and some, a few notes, very modest level. And then um, contrasting with that at the other end of the spectrum is the very substantial... Um, amount of material uh, we were required to produce for this Zondervan NIV study Bible. It's one of the bigger, thicker study Bibles that uh, one could get one's hand on. And let me just say by way of introduction, um, there are study Bibles, of course, that just one single person has written. Well, that kind of thing can happen. You get, you get one author, writes his or her own study Bible. There are study Bibles that are brought out by denominational groups. There are study Bibles that have a particular subcategory of the uh, culture in mind, like the woman plumber's study Bible. Or, I mean, I, this is a caricature, but they seem to me that narrow. Or uh, the... Uh, co-pilots study Bible uh, or the like. Uh, it's amazing how many of those there actually are um, where the desire is somehow to reach people who fit a category and who might find that somehow the people doing the notes and the introductions have paid attention to their particular small world. But this study Bible really attempts to be um, a kind of a mini commentary. And what's very good about it, which doesn't happen always in the case of study Bibles by any means, what's very good about it is 
they took scholars who had already published major works on the particular areas or topics and, and certainly the various books of the Old and New Testament and asked them to do uh, introduction and notes in a much condensed form. Now I've written a major commentary on Hosea in the Word Biblical Commentary series and in fact I'm redoing that. Um, that commentary will come out again. Uh, the Word Biblical Commentary is being redone after 25 years and we get to make uh, contributions. So I'm going back through many of the sentences I wrote uh, 25 years ago and more and inserting the two words obviously not <laughs> in, in many of the observations I made at that time to just, to just bring it up to date. <laughs> but no, I, I, there, are, there are corrections, there are changes. But you'll find that everybody who has written for the, uh, this particular study Bible is a person who has um, already established a reputation as what we might broadly call expert, as having expertise on that particular book. And then you get a condensation of it. This is a very nice thing. The same uh, basic approach was taken with the uh, new Bible commentary. That one volume commentary that InterVarsity publishes did the same thing. They asked people who had already written major commentaries and put in all the thousands of hours involved in doing that to then condense their work. So you get the judicious and careful and well-digested um, and condensed comments um, from scholars who are trying to tell you what's really important, what's really central. central. And I think even a pastor can use a study Bible. You can say, I'm going to let the, uh, this study Bible help me decide what it is that is important for me to cover as I do a two-week or 20-week or whatever exposition through this particular biblical book. So what would you say then would be some of the challenges that you faced as you condensed down to fit into uh, this size of a commentary, Bible study, um, than the major commentary? Same challenge I face every time a student asks me a question in class, I can't stop talking. <laughs> so you really do have to force yourself to leave out what you would love to be able to say because so many things are interesting to you. You may have spent years working on that particular part of the Bible and really trying to understand it. Um, and there's so much that's so rich and you just can't do that. So the biggest single challenge uh, for any of us who contributed to it, I'm sure, was uh, deciding what could be said within the word limit because as you can imagine in a project like this, there was a very, very strict uh, word limit. And um, I had a word limit for Hosea of 10,000 words. That's not bad. Um, and then the second challenge was uh, the editor. Uh, the editor is uh, Don Carson, who uh, is a very fine scholar and teaches at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and is obviously very seriously obsessive compulsive <laughs> because uh, Carson didn't let any of us just submit what we had done. He came with... Uh, in, in, in everybody's case, hundreds of questions. And I can remember talking to Professor Schnabel about this a few years back when we were both starting to work on the project and we had submitted um, our materials. Usually, you, ha you know, editors give you a few questions. In that particular case, um, uh, Carson had come back to each of us with uh, scores of questions and suggestions. You don't really mean that, do you? And uh, uh, 
How would anybody be able to agree with that? Or what's the evidence for this? Or where do you get this? And so on. So um, Schnabel actually wrote him back and said, do you really want me to do this? Are you that disappointed with my work? You know? And, and I just said, ah, he's obsessive compulsive. I can diagnose it from here. So, <laughs> but actually, I ended up producing almost 13,000 words because of all the uh, uh, really uh, pointed questions that Carson had that he wanted answered. Mm. As, so he was a very thorough editor, very, very thorough, very involved. And... Uh, it represented a challenge, but I think in the end it made, you know, if somebody's unconvinced, you say, okay, how can I, in 30 words, <laughs> be convincing on this point? Uh, how can I be persuasive in, uh, with just a few uh, additional words um, in connection with something where an editor has said, I'm not persuaded? Now, you brought another volume with you. How do these two volumes compare? I also brought along a study Bible that I've contributed to that I have found over the years most Gordon Conwell students don't know much about. And I'm going to pass this around too because I want to commend it to you. It's called the Quest Study Bible. Now in this one I contributed to a number of uh, Old Testament books uh, and not to Hosea. So it's a, quite a, a different uh, set of materials. But as you all know, I'm omnicompetent, so there was no problem moving <laughs> outside the Minor Prophets. But the Quest Study Bible uh, started out as a very interesting project that I think has been quite successful. They took every passage of Scripture, and of course there are hundreds and hundreds of them, and put them before various focus groups. And they uh, would have these groups uh, sit around a table. Uh, they'd have them read through the passage. And they'd have them go verse by verse and say, what questions come to your mind about this verse, these verses, this passage? And uh, these focus groups were lay people. They were uh, the kinds of folks you and I have in our churches, that you and I minister to and, and pastor and love and spend time with and care for and pray for. And these people came up with questions. Some of the questions were very obvious and, and, and could be dealt with easily. Some of the questions are very complicated. Uh, when the editors were able to answer the questions because they had uh, good competence themselves, they did so. But they also came to scholars at a certain stage, and I was one of them, and said, we're not really confident in answering the, these questions and or we think we've got a fairly decent answer here. Would you look at it and see if it's really accurate or not? Would you rewrite it if it isn't? And so um, uh, a group of scholars, one, and I was one, uh, weighed in on answering those questions. And so in total, there are thousands of little questions in this. You'll see when, as you look at it, as I pass it around, that uh, are actually asked and then answered. Now you might say, well, why not just give people information, make comments, anticipate questions, and let it go at that? Uh, I think actually the genius of this is that many people don't think of a question that actually they'd love to have answered. You ever have that happen in class? It seems to me it happens a lot in class. Person A raises her hand and asks a question, and persons B, C, D, E, F, and G, and so on say, well, I don't know the answer to that. I'm glad she asked. So it's really a nice thing to um, have questions that were indeed raised by real human beings, and then have them uh, answered uh, briefly and concisely, but hopefully accurately. So, uh, by contrast, I'm going to pass around this Quest Study Bible. Oh, thank you. First, so even though we're talking mainly about the Zondervan uh, NIV Study Bible, the new one, uh, uh, that can go around because I've said what I wanted to say about that one. 
So in, in, as far as Hosea, why Hosea? Uh, you mentioned that you had written the larger commentary. Um, what <coughs> is it about Hosea that's drawn you to uh, do the kind of work that you've done in it? Yeah. Well, as you can imagine, I didn't write them and say, I'd like to do Hosea. They wrote me and said, we need you to do Hosea. So that's how it starts. But um, the, uh, the joy of working with Hosea comes in a, in a number of areas. One is, there are some things in the book that really are misunderstood. Uh, when you ask many people who have a bit of a knowledge of the prophetical books, what they can remember about Hosea, most people can remember uh, that uh, God told him to marry a prostitute. Now that's actually not correct. It is an interpretation. There are many scholars who hold to it. I think it's absolutely wrong and violates the rules of Hebrew grammar. Uh, God did not do that. What God said was, the whole nation is into, quote, prostitution, which is a standard term in the prophetical books. Ezekiel uses it way more often than Hosea. The whole nation's into, quote, prostitution, a standard Old Testament metaphor from um, the Pentateuch and, and, and the Psalms and the prophets all over the place for idolatry and polytheism. Prostitution is false religion. You're giving yourself over to false gods. And um, so uh, the fact that he is told in Hosea 1-2 to uh, marry a woman of prostitution using terminology that's not ever used for an actual person who sells sex, and to have children of prostitution, which is never used for children who were born to a prostitute, and um, to do this as a symbolic act reflecting the fact that the entire nation of Israel has gone fully into prostitution, again, symbolizing metaphorically uh, their uh, heterodoxy. Uh, I wanted to make that point. Mm -hmm. And um, since it is a point that not all scholars get, because I'll let you in on a secret, uh, a great many common, t uh, I've told this to all the students in intermediate Hebrew many times, but uh, a great many uh, Old Testament professors uh, who teach uh, Old Testament courses in seminaries and so forth and write books on the Old Testament never had an intermediate Hebrew course, and their knowledge of Hebrew is not very good. I know these people personally, I assure you, they would have real serious trouble if you said to them, would you uh, just translate this for me and held open something in the Old Testament from Hebrew? So uh, a lot of people just go along with whatever has been uh, ha habituated before by uh, comments. So that's one of the things. I wanted also to be able to talk about um, the structure of the book and the way that um, it, it's not like other prophetical books. So many of them start out with uh, all the near-term dire predictions of God's judgment, and then they shift over at the end to the long-term predictions of a great future and a new covenant and all the blessings that will come that we know in Christ and, and everyone who is in Christ will know forever. But that uh, bifid organization of a book, uh, woe first, wheel second, is not the way uh, Hosea works. Instead, Hosea, like Micah, uh, for example, has a, a mixture of uh, woe and weal. So you're, you're reading along about all kinds of judgment, and then all of a sudden, Hosea doesn't say, now, friends, allow me to speak of the glorious future so we don't go too many chapters with this miserable stuff that I have to say. He doesn't do that. Just all of a sudden, you get uh, positive statements. And the relation of those positive statements to the negative predictions can be understood, can be explained, can be elucidated for a reader, and give the reader the full picture. 
But unless somebody does it, it is not instinctive for the average modern reader to realize that there has been a transition and it's very purposeful and it's balancing what's gone before so that uh, an ancient Israelite and a modern Christian need to keep in mind that there are many, many terrible hardships ahead in a fallen world. But at the same time, we look forward to eternity when those hardships are eliminated and uh, joy and bliss are the standard fare of a beautiful future. Would you like him to Could you get that, uh, Rashad, please? Thanks. I'm not going to pass it out. No, you have to go sit down. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. You're so kind. <laughs> but before I pass it out, uh, I want to mention how many Gordon Conwell associated folks uh, had a role in this particular study Bible. It's really quite a nice thing. And a um, uh, number of them are former faculty, some are current faculty, a number are former students. So just very quickly, numbers is the, the note, the introduction and notes are by Jay Sklar, former student here at Gordon-Conwell, now teaches at Covenant. Uh, John Currid, who now teaches at Reform Seminary in Charlotte. Um, these are all my former students, by the way, because um, I've just been here too long. That's really the problem with this. Uh, you, you, if they're alive and they went to Gordon-Conwell, I had them. Um, Karen Jobes, who used to teach here, did a couple of different books, including Esther. Bruce Waltke, who taught here a number of times, did Proverbs and Micah. Uh, Professor Donna Petter did Ezekiel. Uh, I did Hosea, uh, Bruce Waltke, who I mentioned before, also did um, a, a couple of articles. Um, Phil Long, who teaches at Regent, uh, did Nahum. He's a former student. Uh, Jason DeRoshi did Zephaniah. He's a former student. Uh, Ricky Watts at Regent did Mark. He's a former student. He was one of my advisees. Um, Eckhart Schnabel was one of my advisees. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he did 1 Corinthians. Uh, for this. That, that one's actually competently done. You can count on that. Um, uh, Karen Jobes also did First Peter. Tim Keller, I can remember Tim Keller in exegesis classes, um, did an article on the story of the Bible and a couple of other things. Uh, Moises Silva, who used to teach here, wrote on the topic, The People of God. So, tremendous number of contributions. Now, I would love to have you come and grab it so that people could get their hands on it. But um, one, one final question, and then we'll open it up for questions from folks, is um, as, as you look at commentaries, because this rises out of some of your comments here, what are some of the considerations that a, a student and pastor might want to have as he or she prepares for preaching in terms of uh, commentaries? There are a lot of different things to watch out for. One of the dangers in a commentary is that the commentator will belabor the obvious. The stuff that any, you know, especially if you're a Gordon Conwell trained, the stuff you could figure out on your own so easily and will naturally do. And then they will not address the things that are really mysterious and complicated that you're dying for an explanation for. And there are a lot of commentaries that are exactly like that. That is what they are. So the commentator has been, in effect, uh, lazy with regard to solving problems, uh, but perfectly energetic with regard to saying what anybody who was carefully working his or her way through the book could have said. Uh, what, what commentaries ought to do is help you with the problem areas while not giving up on pointing out what is simple and clear, but there's no reason to belabor what is obvious. Just go over it and over it at enormous length. Um, effort ought to go into making sure that a person feels competent to understand what the arguments are. I think, secondly, another problem with many commentaries is that they are actually not theological at all. I can remember a discussion some years ago, a group of us who uh, teach in the Boston area, teach Old Testament, and uh, Michael Coogan, who teaches 
at uh, Stonehill College and at Harvard was saying, how many of you have read so-and-so's commentary on such and such? I won't tell you who it is, but it's somebody we all knew very well. Uh, all of us knew this uh, scholar, and a number of us had studied with him in the days when we were students together. And, uh, uh, you know, oh yeah, I was like, I always seen this on. He said, you know, he says, I think that commentary is going to ha have um, a long, long uh, history of sales. A lot of people will buy that and use it for decades to come because there is not one word of theology in it anywhere. In other words, <laughs> uh, if you commit yourself to anything theological, and that's where it really helps a pastor preach. If you say, this is what's going on, and this is what it means for a Christian, and this is how we should um, apply it, and here are the, the ways that it has consequence in our lives, and so on, the, the, the sorts of things that most of us who preach really, really want. We want that pointed out. That's great. That's the very thing that a commentator can get away with ignoring. They can leave it out and they can still get the commentary published. Now, the commentary then would contain background information, might contain archaeological information, might contain linguistic information, on and on and on, textual, but it'll never actually pay any attention to the, the real theological interest, which is ultimately what you want. So I think a comment, you need to look for commentaries um, and this may involve a little expense of time. You may need to spend um, an hour looking through a commentary to the extent you can. And often, uh, you know, if it's on Amazon or something, they'll let you look in, inside and read a little bit of it. But see if the commentator is talking about the kinds of things you would preach from that book to help people live for Christ. And if you don't find it, you need to say, I'm going to keep looking. The other thing I would say very quickly, the golden rule of commentary use is never consult only one. Uh, any commentator, no, no matter how inept, may at any given point be brilliant. They get it. They get that verse, even if most of the rest of what they say is just the obvious. And any given brilliant commentator, capable of so much erudition, may just be uh, blinded by elaborate issues of grammar or text or whatever and fail to say what you are wondering about in chapter 5, verse 11. So never consult only one. Thank you. Uh, some folks here may have a question for you about uh, Hosea or other kinds of uh, questions regarding um, commentaries, what have you. Questions? Anybody have a question? Yeah, and, and let me add in a thing, a kind of a recommendation. I do think that if you wanted to have a couple of study Bibles, uh, include the Quest study Bible that I brought along because it will help you anticipate the questions that the folks in your Bible study, your Sunday school class, your congregation, uh, et cetera, are going to ask. And, and that's very good. Um, uh, those focus groups were, were nicely based and, and, uh, uh, from various kinds of people, and um, their questions are good. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. It has good, perfectly good normal introductions and all that, and, and, but it, it really is nice in terms of anticipating questions. It seems to me all teachers and preachers want to try to anticipate questions. But secondly, I do think the new NIV study Bible uh, and you'll see how, when you get your hands on it, you'll see how fine the print is, even for something that would be useful uh, in the back of a pickup truck when you're plowing. 
for all that weight and all, that, all those pages. It, it's really a lot of information crammed in. So it's about the most detailed. Um, you know, there's also the Archaeological Study Bible that we produced here at Gordon-Conwell. It's a wonderful study Bible with a special emphasis on archaeology. There'd be people who might go for that, and I think a pastor using those insights wisely could cause people to really appreciate and feel grounded in um, the, the features and facts and realia of the time period in a way that could be helpful. There's a lot of possibilities. Um, but um, I would also like to suggest something. So in addition, the two I've passed around are the two that I think represent a sort of um, a good balance one with another. But I would also say this. You ought to consider and pray about how to get a, a good study Bible into the hands of everybody in your church. Now, I think this can be done because I've done it. It actually is not that complicated. You first say, uh, you, you call up CBD, and you can call up Zondervan or whatever publisher directly, but you can do this with CBD. You can say, I want to uh, order 80 or six or four million, whatever the size of your congregation is. For you guys, it would be in the millions. For me, it was always six. But, uh, and you say, I want to order a bunch of study Bibles. I want the very best price. Who can I talk to? And each, each publisher will have somebody who can talk discount with you. They're very happy to mail you several cartons of these. So let's say it turns out you can get a study Bible for 15 bucks a piece. You can get the Zondervan uh, NIV study Bible, $15 a piece. Let's say you could negotiate that deal. And you got 100 people in your congregation. That's $1,500. That's substantial. You will find, however, if you share this with people in the congregation, if you mention it, we got a possibility of this, gonna be great. First of all, most people will be thrilled to pay you $15. Because you'll tell them, we got this, this great study Bible, it's terrific. You got people like Donna Petter in there, and Schnabel, and other people that are lesser from Gordon Conwell writing in it. And, and, um, and it's this and it's that, and it has all this stuff. And, and I wanna put this in the hands of each family in the church, or each individual, however you wanna describe it. Um, the retail price is $29, but we can get it for $15. You'll find that maybe 60 or 70 people will pay you the $15. They will. They'll happily do it. Then what you say is, we need some donations for those folks who can't afford this. Because there will be people who can't afford it. Uh, even some people, you might be surprised. They're, they're so under the water and they've got $20,000 on credit cards and they're just not going to pay you $15. Um, and you'll find that there'll be many people, many people who will say, well, I'll give one. I'll pay for one and I'll give one. And you'll get the rest of the money that way. So you can give all 100 families or people or whatever um, one of these study Bibles. And then every once in a while, you don't have to do it every Sunday by any means, but every once in a while you say, Many of you will have noticed that in connection with today's sermon, there's a wonderful photograph of Jeremiah on page 781 uh, of the study Bible uh, with his mother and his wife, uh, uh, just holding hands in front of the temple or whatever. Uh, you'll make some reference to it, whatever it is, and that'll keep them reminded that they can uh, check out this stuff. Many of them will start bringing it to church with them. Sometimes you'll find, these are all just experiences I've had, kids will start you, some high school kids, some junior high kid will start reading the Bible because they love the pictures and the way it's produced and they love the questions and answers if that's what you're dealing with and so on. Um, it, so don't think of it only as a question for you or only as a, as a question for your Bible study group or your discipleship group, should we own this? Ask the question, is there not a way that everybody in our church could get one of these? And then as people uh, come to your church and become members of the congregation, you've got some of those that have already been donated and paid for one of the things you say is you go up to somebody and you say, 
Uh, Louise and Bob, I notice this is your fourth Sunday in a row coming. This is wonderful, wonderful to see you guys and have you worshiping with us. And I'd like to make you a little gift. This is a, a, a study Bible that someone in our church has paid for precisely for somebody like you. Those methods really work, and I really commend that to you as a very practical way um, to get people interested in the Word. One last question. Thank you, Dr. Stewart, for all you've done. Before I came to join my husband at seminary, I listened to all your lectures on um, the Dimensions program, and I fell in love with your teaching then, so I, I, I'm your biggest fan. Anyway, um, uh, would you suggest putting that in the pews or just for their own personal use? It's an excellent question, and I would not suggest putting it in the pew. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's a great thing to have pew Bibles for visitors and so on. You don't want uh, people not to be able to reach for a Bible, and it's nice to... When you say, now look at what you have here in verse 6. It's nice to see everybody's head drop. Wow. That's wonderful. I love that. I love the head drop. Because they are looking at verse 6 with you. So you want, you want pew Bibles, and... And uh, those you can get remarkably inexpensively, as you may know. They're, they're usually available in bulk, very simple editions. But um, I'm thinking of trying to encourage people to read the Bible at home, try to encourage them to look things up. You can even say in a sermon, um, uh, we don't have time today to talk all about the reason that Jehu killed all those fellow uh, princes and royal family members. But it's all right there on page 1126 of your uh, NIV study Bible. Uh, write that down, 1126, check it out at home. And you know, no, will, not, will everybody do that? No, that would be a sign of the end times if everybody did it. But will some people go home and check it out? They sure will. And so that's how I think it works. Make, make it a Bible that they'll think of as their home study Bible, their companion, their aid, when nobody is around to explain it. And I think you'll actually have the best of both worlds. And then I just had two other real quick questions. One, um, why NI, uh, NIV as opposed to ESV? And also, um, how can you help better with uh, the harm that's been done with having projected um, Hosea's wife as being a prostitute and, and also the harm in the communities, well, uh, a woman can go and do harm and, and hurt herself and a godly man will just accept her back. And I think that that's some real stereotype um, harm has been done that way. And how, how can that be corrected? Yeah. Okay, uh, two good questions. Uh, the first, um, by all means, ESV is great. It's a wonderful translation. So I'm not pushing NIV as a translation. It's just that using the NIV, they did a really good study Bible. Zondervan is, of course, the publisher of the NIV. So you can imagine that this project, and they being really pretty much the biggest evangelical publishing house, they were in a position to really put serious money behind it and make it all happen and so on. Uh, these kinds of projects, by the way, require huge amounts of advances. I got 50,000. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, in spite of the fact that we were all grossly underpaid for all the effort that Don Carson put us through, uh, those projects were, are, if you look at the business plans, they are three, four million dollars up front that Zondervan or any other publisher has to commit to. So it's a big, big project. Um, but if it were ESV, it would be just as good or better. So that's no problem. Don't, don't think it's, that, it's the particular version that's the issue. With regard to correcting misimpressions, um, the hope, I think, would be, from my point of view, that as a scholar, all I can do is write it as well as I can possibly write it. And in my new revision of the word biblical commentary, I've added about a 60-page excursus on this, the history of the misinterpretation of Gomer, Hosea's wife, and why it's wrong, why that simply can't be what the text says, it is not, and I'm really convinced of that. So I have this huge thing. People are going to say, oh, Stuart's become 
compulsive obsessive after hanging around with Carson. That's what they'll think. Um, but anyway, it's there. It's very big and lengthy. So if I don't get hit by a bus before it comes out, that'll appear. My hope is that gradually that would filter down to people. Um, and now a, a popular, I hope, and uh, widely read, I hope, study Bible will have it, will have my view on that, which I think is right, and which uh, Carson was able to accept graciously, even though he hates it with all his heart. He, this does, he's, he's still not persuaded. He's probably fuming right now in some location. But um, too bad he was gracious to say, okay, uh, you provide a persuasive case and we'll let it go. Um, uh, and then I think it's always the job of the individual pastor. That's why there are pastors. That's why we're all called imperfect as we are, to help people with misunderstandings. And if you are going to preach through or teach through Hosea, and um, this is an issue you think ought to be addressed, I think it should because it's kind of important to the way you interpret the whole book. Um, then see if you think I'm right. And if you are, you can be uh, the real in uh, interpreter for however many people uh, that reaches. Um, you can't change everything, but you can change as much as you can for the good. And I think the message of the book becomes much clearer when people are not distracted by this question, how could God tell him to marry a prostitute? What sense does that make? What's the point? Um, uh, I think it's a much clearer book when you are free from that misunderstanding. Well, we're grateful for you being able to share with us about the um, NIV Study Bible and the different aspects of commentaries and your insights, of course, with uh, Hosea. And would you please join me in, in thanking Dr. Stewart for being with us. And, and please also join me in prayer as we pray for him and his ministry. Lord God, we're grateful for Doug Stewart and for the way that you've placed your hand upon him signally, allowing him and enabling him to do the work that he has been doing for all these years and the ways in which you've used him as a scholar and also as a pastor. Thank you for his insights in both of these areas. And would you strengthen him as he continues to do the work to which you've called him? And uh, as he teaches, would you fill him and guide him? As he writes, would you encourage him and give him facility of thought? And Lord, would you most of all use him to honor your name? For that's our desire for ourselves and for this uh, servant. For we ask it in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. Amen.